Hi, uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, welcome to yet another exciting day of the Certification Sound Design Seminar. Um, I'm Sujay Swasta, uh, first year student at the MCD program uh, based at the Tornai. Um, so a little info before we start. Um, just like the previous days, uh, the seminar will last for uh, 90 minutes. Uh, when the, like, we'll have two sessions, uh, 45 minutes each, and then in between we'll have a 10 minutes break. Uh, and also, um, everyone is invited to ask questions. Uh, uh, like, uh, I will, um, like in the 10 minutes, uh, I mean, in two, two sessions you can ask questions. Uh, uh, maybe in the five minutes uh, before uh, the first uh, part, and then after uh, the um, second part, so that we'll have uh, uh, continuous sessions going on. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to introduce the speaker for today. Uh, I studied uh, physics and received a PhD in computer science uh, from Bfield, uh, the Bielefeld University in 2002. Uh, he is currently the head of uh, Ambient Intelligence Group uh, within SciTech, uh, the Center of Excellence in Cognitive Interaction Technology at the Liverpool University. Uh, he initiated and coordinated all triannual European Interactive Certification Workshops since 2004. Uh, he was also Vice Chair and German Delegate of the EU Cost Action, IC0601, on Sonic Interaction Design from uh, 2008 uh, to 2011. Uh, he's also a guest editor of four special issues on uh, uh, interactive solidification, uh, IEEE, Multimedia, and Springer Journal on Multimodal User Interfaces, and editor of the Sonification Handbook. Um, his research focus is on sonification, data mining, human computer interaction, and ambient intelligence. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, let's put our hands together <laughs> and welcome Dr. Thomas Herman. Thank you very much, Sumi. Do you need to activate the talk? Okay. No, that should be off. No, it's off. Okay? Yeah. Can you hear me? Good. So, great. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction. So, as you heard for today's session, I, um, we'll be uh, looking into sonification techniques beyond parameter mapping sonification for applications in data mining and biofeedback. And I've been asked to also give a little bit of an overview of the different possible application areas. So uh, it's going to be a potpourri of lots of uh, examples that uh, I've been working on over the last 15 to 20 years. So let's get started. So uh, the first question is, how do we explore the real world? Huh? We are explorers, so how do we do it? Yeah? So this is a typical situation uh, where we... Uh, perceive our world yeah? and it's characterized by we use all our senses. Yeah? We are immersed in this world which is visual, which is auditory. We feel the sun rays on our skin. We have uh, the, we perceive the humidity of the air in our breath. We smell. We have got this multi-sensory experience which makes our world so wonderful, lovely and rich. Yeah? And uh, obviously our mind, our uh, brain, our sensory apparatus is just tuned so that we can fuse all the sensor streams and make some holistic perceptual unit out of it and be in touch with the world around us. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, and sound, of course, plays an important role here. We would e easily hear what the ground substance below our feet is from the sound of the gravel and uh, footsteps. We will hear the rustling leaves the wind, birds singing, insects, all this is effortlessly uh, fused into our understanding. Even if a church bell is ringing some, some uh, uh, kilometers away, we will have this impression and use this, perhaps even subconsciously. Yeah? Yeah. But this is in a quite interesting contrast to how we actually explore patterns in data. So here, this is a typical situation where people are looking on data, maybe monitoring systems, and it's even worse in this uh, trading places in the big banks. They have a battery of visual displays that they uh, constantly look to. Yeah? And um, okay, you see some of the guys have headphones, so headsets, uh, so obviously there's also a little bit to hear, but you see that basically the 95% of the information processing is done visually. 
and uh, um, we could say there uh, we do not address all our senses uh, to the degree they are uh, made for us available by evolution uh, in the real world. So there's a discrepancy, and sonification sets out to uh, to work on that and to bring our uh, perceptual qualities better into the process of understanding uh, data worlds. So sound is a little bit of a neglected modality. Uh, I don't need to praise it too much here. You are already aware of sound and studying this topic intensively. But it's a neglected resource. It has lots of abilities, backgrounding, habituation, high time resolution. We can do some holistic listening. We can attend to the, to the whole. And at the same time, we are sensitive to any local changes in the sound. Um, sound is excellent in directing our attention. And if you hear some sound event, your uh, look goes to there instantly, subconsciously. And we have this ability to learn, to understand sounds uh, step by step uh, from, from uh, as we, we listen. So that, that's rather, rather effortless. So let's make use of that. And in fact, that has been made use of in, in uh, a number of traditions, one of them being um, the uh, stethoscope, where of course uh, for auscultation, for percussion of the human body, the physicians have been listening to sound for a long time and used it as a source for diagnosis. But also in, uh, in other fields, like if you bring your car to a mechanic because it, the engine has a problem, the first thing he's going to ask is to, how oh, could you start the engine? And by listening to the sound, uh, he or she will have a, very quickly an idea what's going wrong. So they are experts in listening to machines. However, if it comes to uh, data spaces, and we are in the information age, more and more of our information is digital and not available sensorily. Yeah? So um, then we do not have good interfaces to uh, inspect, monitor, understand, and explore patterns in these realms. And sonification aims to extend our listening skills, our abilities that we have in the real world into these normally silent data spaces. Okay, here's a nice example to get us started. Uh, uh, we have a noise generator here, 300,000 numbers. So um, if you look at this series of random numbers, what you see is the plot here in the lower left corner. Um, but we don't see the 300,000 numbers, but only 3,000 of them. So 1%. Uh, we do not see much structure. It looks pretty random. So let's try harder. What how can we do in order to understand whether there is something in it or not? What we can do is maybe to do a spectrogram. Yeah? So we plot here, make an analysis of little in, in time windows of the different energy in the frequencies and do that for different time windows. And then we see something like that. And OK, uh, our eye may uh, be drawn to something here in the low frequency realm. Here seems to be some yellow channel. And um, knowledge will tell us, OK, there might be something energy and oscillation maybe at low frequencies. But that's about it, what we can find out by um, using visual means, plotting of data. So uh, now let's see what our ear can pick up. And uh, we take the uh, technique of audification that we learned already yesterday and just play the data as if it would be a sound signal. So I hope it will. Oh. Okay, so it was very noisy, yeah? But maybe you have heard this oscillation. Indeed. Have you, have you yeah. this, ooh, this sound? Yeah. I'll play it again, listen to that. And you heard that this, this has been going up, ooh, yeah, 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 it's going up a little bit. It's not, ooh, it's, ooh. Yeah? So this is a feature which is absolutely invisible. You cannot see it from the plot. And if you see the plot, you have, would not have the idea that this is maybe something you would like to zoom in and see whether there's some temporal dependency. But on listening, this is immediately perceived. But there's an, something else you have noted. What was it? Uh, the rhythm. Yeah. Okay, have the others also heard the rhythm? Yeah? 
Uh, it was like a something like that. Listen to it again. Okay, so there's something weird going on. Uh, actually, this is very subtle, but the E is picking up uh, up front very first. Yeah, so. Uh, obviously, this happens every 300 milliseconds, yeah? and as we play data with 44,000 samples per second, you know that's roughly 15,000. Yeah? So what we have is obviously there's a glitch in the random number generator, and every 15,000 numbers it's starting for anew. So they, the numbers are not really random. So yeah, there should be an autocorrelation with a large lag. Yeah? But if you look at autocorrelation, what you see is it's, it's one and then it falls off to zero and stays zero. So you basically don't uh, assume that there's anything in. Yeah, you would not, uh, out of thin air, have the idea to check for an autocorrelation with a lack of 15,350 samples. You mm -hmm. wouldn't do it. Yeah? So there's a risk that you would just not see this pattern, which is very apparent, obvious, because you would fail to recognize it. You would, it, it would just, you would just ignore it. Yeah? You are ignorant to this pattern. And so this is a, a crucial issue where sonification is very helpful. We can use it to, um, to discover patterns which are previously unknown. And in this sense, the sonification works a little bit like a bottle opener. Yeah? So, uh, a bottle opener is instrumental if you've got a closed wine bottle and uh, then you open it and you can enjoy the wine. Yeah? The same here with inductive data mining. The listening to the data will get us ideas on what type of patterns is hidden. Yeah? And once we see, oh, that's uh, something, uh, in, uh, repetition structure, then we can, of course, analyze the signal and maybe show it even much better mm. using visual means than by, by listening to it. So then the, the sonification has fulfilled its purpose and can be put to rest, like the bottle opener can go back in the drawer. We don't need it anymore. Yeah? But uh, there's lots of use in this bottle opener because if we wouldn't have it, we wouldn't have got the bottle open in the first place. <coughs> so no wine. Yeah, bad. <laughs> Okay, you see, this is uh, uh, the situation with uh, sonification for inductive data mining. And in the inductive data mining part is the hugest uh, challenge we've got nowadays. We've got so many algorithms in machine learning, but they can only find what they are asked to search for. But it, it needs us humans to put the question to in the first to bring uh, forth the question in the first place and to design these algorithms to be able to discover patterns so it needs the human in the loop to to get these ideas and so sonification is very important for uh, allowing us to generate hypotheses then the computers and the machine learning etc is good for verify hypotheses or work it out but we can't skip that first step and if we only look with visual means we risk uh, ignoring some important features in data. Okay, so uh, we can skip the part over definitions because we worked on taxonomy and definitions extensively yesterday. So let's just uh, uh, go uh, uh, and recapitulate a little bit. We said that there's a number of uh, sonification techniques, audification, auditory icons, earcons, parameter mapping, sonification, these are well known uh, uh, more or less everywhere. Um, there are two more techniques which will be in the focus today. That's model-based sonification and wave-space sonification. And I will try to convince you why these are really different um, um, conceptual approaches from parameter mapping. So that it's really something different. But for uh, the next part, we would rather first uh, have this broad overview and I show a number of possible application areas for sonification uh, and auditory display, just to illustrate how versatile sonification is and where it can be applied. Uh, so it's, of course, this is not complete, but only a subset of things. So here's a number of claims. Let's get started with the first claim. Sonification can set the eyes free as a replacement of visual information. Uh, for instance, visually impaired people could be uh, 
perceiving the world uh, around if this visual data information is being substituted by some sound, or it can enable otherwise impossible data inspection. Uh, for instance, if you've got a dual attention problem, you cannot look simultaneously at two displays, can either or. So with sonification, you can focus visually on one display and uh, have the information from the other display in an auditory shape. Yeah, and that can uh, enable much better monitoring of complex processes. So here's the first example, uh, EEG. That's something we worked on uh, for some time. So here, this is a sonification of an beginning epilepsy. This little boy uh, is still in, in good shape. And in a few seconds, the epilepsy will start, an absence. Okay, now the boy is back. And you see, this is uh, uh, quite a dramatic change of the uh, dynamics in the human brain. What we have been listening to was the voltages measured on the scalp via electrodes. And in, uh, in a healthy brain, what we expect is a very entropic signal which was less of order, yeah, because uh, maximizing the entropy is uh, the best way of coding information. And in the pathologic state, like the epilepsy, we hear a very clear rhythm, a state of, or, uh, of, of order, of structure. And this is a beating of three hertz around roughly here. Yeah? And normally, um, this is a signal that you wouldn't be able to ignore if you look at the graphs and you have seen it in the, in the plots also, such as here, the epilepsy is very well visible. But there are some features which are not so clearly perceived by, if, by looking to the signal. For instance, if you've got nine or ten of these plots, one below the other, would you be able to see whether all the channels are synchronized or whether the synchronization between, let's say, channel one and channel seven is getting a little bit slightly off? You wouldn't be able to see it. And you would see there's waves here, there's waves here, but how they synchronize is difficult to see for the human eye. Huh? So, but uh, synchronization uh, is easily heard. So if you have a sonification of all these channels on top, you will hear that this one is going a little bit earlier or a little bit later. So all these features of temporal synchronization and shifts is becoming very salient in the sound. Uh, or a feature which is also difficult to see here, is this rhythm slowing down or pacing up? You won't be able to see it. Yeah? But in sonification, you can, uh, rhythm is something where we have very high sensitivity. So you can uh, see whether it's slowing down or pacing up uh, by listening very quickly. Yeah? And we've developed a number of techniques to sonify this data. Here, this is what we call event-based sonification. Um, that is uh, using all minima and maxima from your data series and turning it into one little blip. And then the, um, the uh, frequency and the spectral characteristics of this blip depend on how much time it was to the past maximum and what the level difference is between the past minimum, etc. And so let's listen to an, uh, this epilepsy uh, with an event-based sonification. There it is. Yeah. Back to normal. Yeah. And you may have heard this, whoa, these waves. Yeah? These are artifacts. This is how artifacts sound. So even on first time listening, you can discern the normal, regular, basic background pattern and these artifact events and then the epilepsy. The gong, de gong, de gong, de gong. Yeah? Even on first time listening, just speculate how good you can get if you invest in learning this uh, type of uh, language of the brain uh, some hours or some days while you use it in daily routine. So it can be a very powerful means to very quickly see what's going on in the human brain and maybe even enhance uh, differential diagnostics between different types of, of epilepsy pathologies. And very interesting, you can also do it uh, in real time. So the person that is uh, uh, giving his or her brain waves can perceive uh, the, what's going on in their own brain. Here we see it in this video. Yeah. 
And here you see the so-called Berger rhythm, the alpha waves that are coming from the stem of the brain into the visual cortex as you have got your eyes closed because there's nothing to be processed visually. And then it resonates with this alpha rhythm. And this is picked up by the electrodes and can be heard. And that's a standard test to see whether the electrodes are working and it differences a little bit whether you're awake or not. And of course, now you can make situations of neurofeedback where, for instance, you uh, attend to your own brain waves and try to slow them down or make them more clear, etc., in order to, let's say, reach an enhanced meditation state to calm down or whatever your purpose is in neurofeedback. So you see, uh, it is going beyond uh, the uh, only diagnosis and pattern discovery mode into a mode where this can be used to self-regulate your own activity. So let's move on. We've got lots of things to cover, but very quickly, maybe one interesting technique as it also relates to Daniel Formos presentation yesterday. Uh, what we've been introducing is sonification um, using uh, uh, articulatory speech synthesis. And here we hear this absence that we heard with piano sounds just uh, on the last slide. Uh, here we hear it um, with some uh, speech signal. Uh, the result of a parameter mapping, which is too complex to explain in detail, but just listen to it. Oops. Okay. Well, another example. It's easy for me to imitate. And that was the idea for the sonification. If we uh, use vocal information, then listeners would be able to use their language part of the brain to memorize it and use their own vocal tract to uh, reproduce it. So a physician or neurologist could say to a colleague, okay, a patient on uh, room number five just had this epilepsy and not the equi equi epilepsy. So and uh, so, uh, this uh, own vocal tract becomes a pointer, becomes an instrument to reference into the differences between uh, pathologies, like a pointer. Here is how artifact sounds like. So clearly, quite different from from what we heard. And here is uh, sleep, e.g. Okay. So you see, um, Sleepy, can you just explain uh, a bit of, about how the data was um, gathered? Uh, how the mapping is being done? No, uh, the data. Sleep, e e you say? Yeah, that's just recording of EEG during a person sleeping. Okay. And normally you've got these REM phases or different deep yes. sleep levels. And in, uh, in these different phases, you got different patterns, like there are so-called sleep spindles mm -hmm. that are very salient at certain frequencies. And, um, and these patterns are then responsible for effects in the sonification. Okay, so very interesting to, um, to uh, use also vocal signals for these sonifications. But let's maybe quickly move through different things. I'll jump over this process monitoring a bit. Here's another claim, interactive sonification can substitute or amplify sensory information to point to relevant perceptual qualities or to enhance skill learning. So using in physiotherapy, in rehabilitation, or in sports performance. Here's just one example where uh, he, uh, we, we have added a sensor to the frog of a bow and a violin, and then uh, this is going to help you make a linear movement of the, of the bow. Instead of what uh, I would do is uh, uh, anatomically, I would make a semicircle more or less. Yeah, mm. but making a straight line is a complex coordinated movement. So let's see how sonification can support us in that. That's Tobias Grosshauser who has uh, done it in during his time in Bielefeld, and you hear listening to his, two strokes, which where he's doing it correct, and then two strokes with some error. And now come the error. I apologize, the video and audio is a little bit out of sync, but possibly they heard this 
And that's not coming from the string, nor from the bow. That's coming from the sonification system, which is picking up dif dif differences in the uh, linear acceleration of the sensor and is you know, creating a sound which is noise-like. And since you're listening anyway, you can easily fuse what you hear from your, from your instrument with what you get as a feedback. And this can remind you to uh, adapt your movement uh, as needed. Another device that we've built is the parking aid for the uh, drilling machine. So if you would like to drill a hole into the wall, you would like to have this perpendicular, so orthogonal. Yeah? But you can make two types of errors. You can be left, right wrong or can up and down wrong. So uh, uh, this parking aid is giving you some feedback on what the actual angle is. And this is realized by uh, using here distance sensors, proximity sensors on various locations and some loudspeakers integrated into the drilling machine. So here. Oh, a little bit to the left. To the right. Also, we have different pitches for up and down. This will be up. And now let's get it drilled. Okay, good. So this is uh, how you can uh, uh, support also some very uh, daily machines like uh, a drilling machine or a gripper or whatever. Yeah? So using sonification not only in high-level applications but also for everyday tools. Okay, uh, maybe I'm jump over that, but uh, let's look at uh, this example here. Um, sonification. Um, swimming is an uh, area where you would not necessarily uh, expect uh, sound to be used, uh, nor would you expect a visual display to be used because having a computer underwater is very difficult. But swimming is a complex uh, manipulation of water mass and normally what's happening, you see it here, is if you do some movement, you uh, create some effects in the water which then give you in a ring shape pattern propulsion, there's a particle in uh, velocimetry measurements here. And for that reason, it, uh, uh, coaches recommend swimmers to pay attention to how they actually manipulate the water mass around them. Mm -hmm. They are not pushing off from the water. They are uh, manipulating the water so that there's an indirect effect giving them propulsion. Mm -hmm. And actually it's only about 8% of your energy that you invest physically which you can transmit into something to give you propulsion. So it's much more use of, uh, instead of training your muscles and having more power, to just swim more smartly. And how can you enhance the smartness? We have been thinking that the feel for water can be developed by using sonification. And normally what you have uh, available is your uh, proprioceptive information. You know where your arms and legs are and you know the forces that you can perceive directly. And maybe you can also observe how fast you are if you uh, observe the, the, the pool or the ceiling or whatever. But what you can find hard to, uh, to see is how actually you manipulate the water mass. So there are some intermediate effects. And these intermediate effects is what we measure, capture with sensors and which we feed back to the swimmers to, uh, to refine their swimming style. Practically, we do it by We've developed here, that's together with Bodo Ungerechts and Daniel Cesarini, some um, uh, sensors, tubes, which are put between the fingers. And then uh, uh, you can see in this video here uh, how this is being uh, sounding in, in, in <coughs> use. Okay, maybe that's enough of it. So you see, it's a very interesting uh, uh, perception of the situation because the sound becomes something which is shared for both the coach who was cueing me to, to do the next <laughs> swimming cycle and for myself. So I can play with the sound and see if I modify my movements, how the sound is changing. The sound is 
but in conveying what is happening also for the coach who can't see through my body because my body is obstructing the view to to uh, my right arm or something like that and um, and then you uh, can use uh, the sound as a kind of interaction glue which is mediating interaction between the coach and the swimmer for instance a coach could say something like okay and now try to change your movement so that the sound gets higher early on and stays high pitched for a longer time so instructions like these are impossible if you won't have the sonification and they are very meaningful if you've got it because then you can experiment with it and so what we are working to at the moment is that you uh, have this available uh, whenever you swim. At the moment, the system needs to be carried with a laptop along the pool, which is, of course, limiting the, the use time uh, quite strictly. Okay, so uh, let's move on. Uh, there are lots of different variations of these techniques. This is basically parameter mapping sonification, by the way. Uh, the next one, sonification can serve as an auditory loop or time-lapse to uncover hidden structures. Here, this example for that is uh, traffic data sonification. Here, this is uh, 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 traffic information from a German uh, highway, Autobahn, between Cologne and Löwenich. And 10 days, roughly uh, uh, several hundred thousand uh, uh, vehicles passing along. The question is, ah, by sonifying this data, can we discover any pattern uh, which is changing before a traffic jam is setting in. Mm. That would be very useful to hear, so they can have a warning, etc. And so I sonified this data a long, long time ago and just listened to, to one sonification here. So, midnight. Rush hour. Traffic jam. And back to normal. Okay, and you, what you heard here is just about 100,000 uh, individual sounds, which are a uh, discrete parameter mapping. Every sound is being created, uh, uh, representing a single vehicle. We've got three tracks of that highway, the right, middle, and left. They are uh, uh, rendered as a stereo panning, and then the frequency is the velocity of the vehicles. Then there's more to the data, also the distance to the vehicle in front of you and whether this vehicle is a, a bus, a lorry, or an, uh, just a car. And, uh, and if you uh, invest a little bit of time, you can discern these different streams and you can hear the constant, uh, constant velocity lorries and uh, see how the fast uh, cars try to take over. Yeah, so it's very interesting. So you, you get um, a very rapid condensation of traffic within one day in just a few seconds of sound. And that might be useful in a number of situations, not necessarily only for traffic on, on roads, but if you are a system administrator and you come into your office in the morning and would like to see what has been going on for the last night, then you could review uh, the history by just having the sonification of last night's activity being played to you in, in 10 seconds or so, and you would have a very lively idea on what's going on. Okay, sonification can enable a subliminal and unobtrusive awareness of relevant data, particularly in those situations where we are focused uh, on another primary task. And here is an example. Uh, the Sonic Chair is a device we developed uh, in, in Bielefeld many years ago. And uh, you will know it has been in, in, in Oslo, even in the, in the science exhibition. So what the idea is, we have developed a flexible smart skin for furniture, a low-cost open hardware solution, which is sending what's going on while you uh, sit on your chair. And let's just quickly see how this data uh, would sound if we just do a mapping sonification. Uh, so the moment I sit down, you see that the sounds are coming here on the left panel. You see um, the, the seat. If I lean back, I, the the other four sensors in the in the back are activated, and so this is a sonification of interactions 
with an office chair. So why would you do that? Uh, actually, you would not. That's just a demo. We did the opposite. We measured if you are sitting on the chair, but do not use your back. Yeah, Sitting on the chair, working without moving your back is not very healthy. So what we are computing is the amount to which you are lazy with your back. Yeah? And if this laziness is exceeding a certain threshold, then maybe it's a good idea to uh, nudge you into some uh, stretch your back, moving your spinal cord a bit so that... Uh, You, you stay healthy while it's doing yeah? so And we do it by if this uh, laziness is getting too high, then slowly some sounds are increasing in level. We use some cicades, some insect sounds. like <laughs> And they get louder and louder. They are still so quiet that you won't be able to hear them. They are below your threshold in quiet. But at what point? At one point, you will uh, perceive it. So it's on your threshold of uh, uh, liminal perception. And then you can be reminded, oh, maybe it's a good idea to stretch your back. And you will do so. And by doing so, the uh, furniture, the chair is sensing activity and it's re resetting the laziness counter. Mm. So uh, it is an auditory display which is very subtle. Yeah? Most of the time you won't be able to hear it at all. And, uh, but it is uh, inducing some healthy behavior. And we did it also with this uh, sonic shower. I think I mentioned that Uh, already uh, that this is possible. Okay, maybe one uh, last thing before we uh, close the uh, have the break. Uh, here, auditory augmentation. The approach uh, we are contact. Uh, this is joint work with Till Bovermann and René Tunnelmann. And here we uh, attached a contact microphone to a keyboard, and then modified that sound according to some um, weather data. So as you type your, um, on, your, on your keyboard, you, it will sound differently. So here, this is called Wetterheim, the system. Let's listen. So this is our keyboard sounds. Now it sounds different, doesn't it? Oh. Very cold weather, a different sound of your keyboard. Let's listen to another one. But very nice, you can catch up this information and I can talk to you all at the same time. It doesn't distract you very much. So that's a way how uh, information can be uh, perceived without distracting or disturbing you. And why would you like to do it? For instance, if you would like, in Trondheim weather is very erratic, so you are sitting and typing your email, and all of a sudden you hear a change of your keyboard sound, and this is a forecast of precipitation of rain in the next hour. And then you can say, okay, maybe now it's a good moment to get home before I get uh, drenched in water in rain. Uh, uh, so, and, and you go from a mode of actively polling the weather information to an awareness mode where this information is just available to you all the time, but in such a way that it won't uh, distract or notify you. It, you would just be sensitive to the changes in the sound of your keyboard. Mm. And uh, so I see lots of opportunities for sonification to be more clever in how they couple to our daily activity. And coupling them to our own physical activity is a very smart way to do it because we are rarely annoyed about, annoyed about sounds that we cause ourselves. We are annoyed by sounds that others are causing, yeah? but not of the sounds we ourselves cause. So this is a very good hook to connect sounds uh, to, um, to the environment. So there, there's more arguments and examples to that. Uh, weather f uh, forecast, sonification, tweetscapes, if uh, we've sonified Twitter. Um, but maybe this is a good point to have uh, some Q&A before we go into the break. Uh, are there some instant questions? Ha, yeah, of course. Okay. Uh, hi, thanks uh, for that. That was uh, really inspiring. Um, Just about the last, uh, the last point that you made uh, regarding distracting, distracting sound, or when uh, yeah, I'll just ask a question. In the last few decades, we were talking a lot about pollution, and I'm wondering if uh, when you approach data or a situation you would like to explore and sonify, do you have uh, any regard to the noise pollution aspects? 
don't want to interrupt, you don't want to interrupt others, you want to have it kind of settle uh, and kind of sound. In general, are there any guidelines for good, good ways of uh, sonification, especially with connection to sound pollution? Yeah. There are. Um, actually, that's a frequently raised issue that uh, cluttering our world with sonification would make things worse. In my experience, it is not so. It's the opposite. The uh, awareness of sound and the higher sensitivity of designers and developers to the issue of sound in most situations creates interfaces and devices where you have less sound pollution, even if you've got more sound, because uh, they are then better designed. Just think of the sounds in a supermarket when you have all the zillions of products being uh, uh, checked by the barcode scanner. And normally you have this 1,000 hertz beep, beep, beep at all the batteries of cash systems. And it's so bad that even the, the, the cashiers uh, have a hearing loss at these frequencies. So it's a harmful situation. If you would bring in sonification here, the first thing you would do is to um, have different tones for the different caches so that you do not need to power it up in order to discriminate your own sound from the neighbor's cache system. And uh, in result, you could reduce the sound level of the cache systems quite a bit. And at the same time, you would be able to maybe uh, change the sound so that it's more entertaining also for everybody around that you could maybe distinguish uh, special price offers from vegetables, from, from alcohol or whatever you buy. And so the, uh, the caching process becomes like an aesthetic soundscape, like in a, in a jungle or rainforest or something like that. I could imagine lots of things, but altogether, my experience is this can result in less uh, auditory pollution than what we have if engineers just do and take the piezo safeguard and don't care too much about it. Mm. Is this helpful? Yeah? <clears throat> yeah? But, so, Jürgen? You said that um, uh, you are never annoyed by when you are the one producing the sounds. Less. Like, for instance, the keyboard thing. Yeah. But, yeah, you may not be alone. In the room, yeah, like you have several people around you, so I guess it, yeah, they will be annoyed. Yeah, uh, like uh, yeah, my girlfriend, for instance, when I have a mechanical keyboard at <laughs> home, she gets annoyed by all this yeah. uh, tapping on that keyboard. Yeah. So it, of course, uh, that's a mechanical noise. You can well, it's harder to get rid of, but adding uh, a yeah, like digital. Oh, you, you could of course use headsets, but let's say you use the speakers. I guess you have to think about those that are around also. Yeah. So my, my uh, uh, we do not necessarily need to consider only situations where we've got public audio, so that the audio is broadcasted via loudspeakers to everybody. We can think of a private audio systems. Many people have already these uh, headphones and in ear phones. Uh, if, if, uh, you see them everywhere being used and they have the disadvantage of blocking you from the outside world. But uh, one way would be bound conduction headphones, which deliver you some auditory perception, but without blocking your ear channel. So you have a nice blend an augmentation of the real sound environment with some personal audio that uh, may help you. Yeah? And uh, these systems are to be developed further. So uh, open in-ear headphones or bone conduction systems, and they could resolve uh, solve many of the problems while increasing your personal information space also. So mm -hmm. I would expect some more developments. And also the smartness of systems to project is increasing. So there are loudspeakers which, uh, which only uh, target a very narrow mm. uh, ray yeah, and do not fill the whole space with sound. Like in museums, you've got systems where you can only hear what should be heard in front of an um, exhibit and not anywhere else. And so technology will solve some of these issues. But generally, it's maybe a good idea to be sensitive to where you place a sound. Uh, particularly in uh, critical areas like in, in hospitals. Uh, hospitals are an extremely uh, difficult environment 
because the alarms need to be so loud that they cannot be ignored, but they cause lots of, of pain and suffering for the patients and for everybody else who has to listen to all the alarms from the neighboring sites also. And, and then the surfaces are so that they reflect lot, lots of sound also because they cannot absorb too much, they need to be cleanable, etc. Many issues where um, a careful design is required. Yeah. Yeah. You said that uh, 95% of the information processing is done visually. Ah, do you got me? You said that 95% of the information processing is done visually. Do you think, uh, as a consequence, we will uh, automatically include more of the auditory sense, like in the future, in the development of things, because we're kind of in this time where we're super fed up with screens and stuff like that? Mm -hmm. Okay, first of all, I'm not so uh, precise in these numbers. I would just say yeah. we are a very visually driven culture and you find it also in our proverbs. We say, I only believe it if I see it. And we do not say, I only believe it if I hear it. Yeah? Uh, so, uh, but I think we need to be careful in sonification not to make this argument uh, seeing or hearing. We are uh, multisensory animals. And the best is if you respect that every sensory channel has its own um, um, sweet spot and that we should be bringing these channels in, into concert with each other. Uh, and then the, the ratio on how much seeing, how much listening and how to combine, uh, this needs to be addressed in the individual application. Mm. All right, then... Uh yeah, let's have a 10 minutes break and get back to the second part. Yeah, yeah. thank you very much, Herman. Okay. Thank you. Very inspiring. So, welcome everyone. Uh, so, we are starting uh, the second half of So, so, um, so uh, after the request, we have one question, so can we take it quickly? So yeah, sure, sure. Right. Yeah, no, it's not one of those long questions. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I was just wondering, what was the reason that you chose those sound, uh, that, uh, that you choose those sounds? Were there any special reason for those sounds to be chosen? Uh, to chosen any psychological consultation with people who are experts? Um, and for require, was it required for creating those sounds? I mean, uh, for example. You know what I'm talking about, like the sound that you were, I mean, um, using for sonification of the swimming or the uh, that disease with the brain. Yeah. So, was there a special reason that you chose those? Yes, there's always special reasons, and that's uh, something really, really difficult to answer in in a one minute statement. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, at this time, sonification design is like. Uh, uh, yeah a tailor which makes your suit to your body. So you, you craft the sonification, you design it for a specific task with a specific situation, with a specific audio context in mind. And uh, you have ideas in the design process, you have uh, do a brainstorming of lots of different ideas, how to represent the data in, in what type of sound with what type of mapping. And then you check whether these ideas um, uh, can be uh, can survive the, the discussion of practicality. Like for instance, for the swimming sonification, uh, we, we initially also had the idea of using water waterly sounds. Yeah, but if you use waterly sounds, they are in conflict with the water sounds that you hear while swimming. So you find it difficult to discern whether what you hear is actually the real water environment or a part of a sonification. So that argument would give you um, uh, some repelling from water sounds towards sounds where the, the wrong interference would be uh, uh, reduced. And then you end up with more synthetic sounds. Yeah? And so you are repelled from constraints and this guides you in a way, but not precisely towards some sound that seems to fulfill all the constraints at work. And with this, you live. And uh, sometimes you uh, get a little bit tired and you just say, okay, so let's take them. You never know whether they are going to be uh, much more clever and nicer and more aesthetic and more fulfilling and more informative way to, to, uh, to, to end up with better sounds. 
So basically, this is something which, to my opinion, is a very subjective design stage, and it's open, it's open ended, and uh, um, the hope is only that with some, with many people working on this problem and having different ideas, that uh, with time we are going to converge to a sonification which is a sweet spot in fulfilling all constraints. Like, uh, and, and, and then there's a, I could talk an hour about the de design guidelines, uh, like what is, is the trade-off between aesthetics and uh, information, precision and aesthetics, and how to, uh, to navigate this uh, trade-off. But uh, maybe let's do it uh, this afternoon yeah, think, or so. Yeah, I yeah? think it's, it's quite okay. important uh, to know those guidelines also, but... Uh, since we have like limited time, maybe I would suggest uh, we can do it later. Okay, yeah. good. Thank you very much. Good. So and, uh, let's get started. Oh yeah, I have got to share this, uh, share the slides. One second. Oops. Oops. Share. And here we go. So um, yeah, now let's look into uh, two sonification approaches. The first being model-based sonification. And uh, uh, the motivation for that comes from the problems with parameter mapping sonification. Uh, parameter mapping sonification, you remember mapping some uh, data values to some uh, synthesis parameters. Yeah? And now, what is the problem with this uh, approach? First off, mapping specification is complex and needs to be done for every new data set. You've got a new data set, it's going to have new variables and features. So you need to craft a new mapping. That's pain in the ass. So it's really uh, uh, difficult. Yeah? And because every mapping is new, um, you uh, always need to have that mapping available for interpretation because uh, you don't know what in this new data set was mapped to pitch. So in order to uh, under interpret the sound with respect to the data, you need to look at the mapping. Yeah? And um, mapping implies a mainly passive, non-interactive listening. That means um, uh, basically a data set is mapped to a sound track, and then you listen to the sound track as a, a music track. So you, your role as a listener, as a consumer of the sonification is a little bit passive uh, normally if you, you apply it to data sets. And uh, it is more an attribute specific listening mode. You would attend to independent features of the sound such as what is the pitch curve, what is the sharpness curve, where is the signal panning left and right, things like that. And this is not necessarily the most useful mode in order to in understand the interdependencies and coherences of the data. However, that's the only mode that you can take because uh, the key to understanding the data is in uh, narrowing your focus to individual features. Yeah, then the number of parameters is usually limited. Yeah, like if you've got a synthesizer with, let's say, 10 or 15 controls, this is as many variables as you can represent in your sound. But what do you do if you've got a data set that has 50 or 150 variables, then you are burdened with a choice which parameters of which variables of your data to use for the mapping and which not to use. And this choice is subjective also. So you, you can't have a general mapping of any data with uh, any synthesizer. And to my opinion, it has some bad learning interpretation characteristics because every sonification basically is new. You see, uh, uh, first it looks so good with parameter mapping, but, but these problems are uh, weighing hard and giving rise to the question whether there's not a different link that we can take in order to connect data with sound. And the idea is, uh, uh, the solution is maybe model-based sonification. So uh, to motivate it here, Let's ask the question, what do we hear? So let's do a little experiment here. Please tell me what you hear. So what did you hear? It sounds like water mm -hmm. being uh, pouring into a glass. Mm -hmm. 
Anybody would like to comment or? I like got soda, soda water. Okay, soda from water. A, from a can. Anything more? What did you hear? What? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. yeah, wine bottle. Okay. Yeah, are you, do you all agree? Is this uh, in line with your thinking? Huh? Can we hear it again? Oh, uh, yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> The bubbles, the yeah. sling. Uh, okay, the I stop it here because what I see is already you are putting all your effort not into describing, not into, into answering my question. You didn't uh, tell me what you what you no, heard. Sure. Yeah? <laughs> well, you have been jumping right to the interpretation. You have yeah. explaining what you heard in with regards to what the possible sources are. I heard opening of a can, like. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's not. That's not. Uh, you could have answered. Well, I heard a very transient, high-pitched uh, sound of let's say 100 milliseconds, followed by a gap of silence. Then I heard some turbulent stochastic sound <laughs> with a linear <laughs> modulation. <laughs> and, and then, then you will have no friends. Yeah, this is yeah. what you actually heard, isn't it? Huh? Yes. You never hear a cup or a <laughs> bottle opening. The, 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 what you hear is a sound, and the sound can be described by its acoustic characteristics, mm. isn't it? So, uh, but it's very interesting, it's very revealing, because, of course, everybody listens like what you've done. And this is uh, uh, what we can call listening in the world. So in the world, we, have, we are equipped with this auditory system. And what does it do 24-7? It is... Uh, receiving the sound, holistic sound wave fields and trying to uh, decode the sound field and learning material properties of objects in the world that may be causing that sound. And why is it so? Because the potential causes of sound matter for us. If you hear some tiger approaching in the wilderness, that's important to recognize it correctly and decide whether you would like to fight or flight. Mm. Yeah, the evolutionary very advantages if you if you can reason about possible causes of the sound rather than being able to d describe the sound as such. Yeah? So we uh, our our default mode mode is into causal listening, into listening for the possible causes. And uh, very interestingly, we are uh, uh, in a closed loop situation. So very often we perform actions like here. I put my mobile phone on the desk. Uh, or rattle my key, uh, and and then I get some sound uh, that, that excites a physical system here, illustrated by this drum here, and that excitation excitation is by the means of uh, the physics creating some sound fields, which goes back to uh, me as the initiator of these actions. So we've got a closed loop, and having a closed loop is uh, advantageous to uh, learn the auditory language of the world. So this is how it goes in the real world. Huh? And wouldn't it be much superior if we would be able to sonify data uh, by exploring the same linkage? Huh? Basically, if we do the parameter mapping sonification listening, then we're listening in, in this acousmatic way. We're listening to sound features, mm. pitches going up or down, and the signal shifting from left to right, etc. This is a the listening mode in which you have not responded. You have been responding into what are the causes for the sound. So how can we bring in this causal listening into sonification? And model-based sonification is just doing that. It is taking a different stance in how data and sound signal are linked. And you see it here. The data set is being used for constructing what we call a virtual data object. So let's say um, a mesh of uh, nodes and springs, masses and springs, whatever. There are different uh, possibilities to do so. And this is uh, set up so that it's in a state of equilibrium, like our drum above. Without interaction, there's no sound coming from the drum. Mm. So and now we are equipped with some interaction modes. Yeah, for instance, by money using the mouse or by putting it into an object and shaking it or so. Uh, hammering on it. And by doing so, you inject energy in this virtual object. 
And then as you, as you inject energy, what's happening? Then it's going to behave. There are some dynamics going off. And these dynamics are creating some temporal signal. And this temporal signal basically can be audified or can be used uh, for, for the rendering that's here. And in result, the, the behavior is becoming audible. So you see it's much more indirect than mapping. In mapping, you know what you put in and what you get out. But you get only as much out as you can put in. Here, it is less clear what you get out because it's a higher level of indirectness. But what you can get out is maybe more than what you put in. You can get out some properties which you haven't put in in the first place. So because we are uh, having this holistic listening here uh, explored. And then we can, of course, uh, if you put, uh, establish such a new model, uh, we have no idea how it's going to sound. It's like we are like babies. We are exposed to a new world. And, but we are equipped with this mechanism to learn. So we can just play with it and expose this model to different types of data. And with time, we are going to learn, oh, this is how a normal distribution sounds. This is like a uniform distribution sounds. This is how a distribution with a mixture of Gaussian sounds. And all of a sudden, we, we find ourselves uh, interpreting the causes rather than listening to the sound as such. So much for the hope. Mm -hmm. So let's see uh, how this can be put into action. Here, this is a long list of solidification models that uh, uh, were created, most of them in Bielefeld, with colleagues also. And uh, we couldn't spend uh, many uh, days going through all of them, but let's limit ourselves to, let's say, one or two, so that you got the, the, the idea around it. Uh, and the first model that we're looking into is data sonogram sonification model. So, for every model, what we need to say is what is the setup, what is the dynamics, what is the interaction, and how is the dynamics then connected to the actual created sonification, the, the link mechanism. And so in a nutshell, for the data sonogram sonification model, the setup is that we take every data point, yeah? you know data points are these lines of our data table, and we take each of these points as a point in space. Yeah? like a star in our galaxy. Yeah? So a point becomes a point in space. We, we talk of a data set as a point cloud. Yeah? And then, um, then we say these points are not fixed at that location like a fixed star, but they are attached to where they ought to be according to the uh, values of the data vector with a spring. And the spring is elastic and we give a little bit of a mass for this data point. So if we pinch it, it, make, mm -hmm. it can make some oscillations around that location. Yeah? Uh, and here's already where physics comes in. We have now uh, a Newton's equation of motion uh, and saying that the, any force that we put in is going to change the actuation state. And then we've got some damping, etc. So it becomes a physical system. Yeah? So it already looks a little bit like physical modeling. But uh, that's not enough yet. So what we put in else in this model is the idea of wave propagation. So that we can hit our data set at any location that pleases us. And then a shock wave is expanding through the data space. And these circles that you see here are those circles, are those lines where uh, at a certain time, the shock wave would have reached yeah? after one second, after two seconds, after three seconds, maybe. And uh, whenever a shock wave is uh, crossing or intersecting with a data point, some energy is carried over to the data point. Mm -hmm. So it starts to oscillate. Yeah? And then we can, uh, like I'm here hitting on an object at different locations, I, we can uh, hit on our data surface and see how it sounds at the different locations. So that's basically um, the idea. So the excitation would be the shock wave mechanism and pre pressure waves. And for the sonification, we just take these oscillations of the data point masses around their location as a sound signal. And then we may decide even wh where to put the listener. For instance, one idea is if I hit the data space here, I would have uh, 
everything which is left of that on the left channel, everything that's right of it and on the right audio channel, so I would have a spatial uh, audio display. Good. So let's listen to uh, some data sonogram uh, examples. Let me click here. Yeah. And now you heard all these data points. When clicking here, when I click here, and you heard this first sound. This was just to give us a feedback at what point in time I've done the clicking. So just to give you a reference, actually, if you do it yourself, you won't need it because you know when you have clicked. But that's useful for you as the audience to see uh, what the time point is when the clicking was. Yeah? You heard that there have been two different pitches. And in fact, uh, here for this breast cancer diagnosis data set, whether the uh, cancer tissue is benign or malignant was mapped to, to the spring stiffness. Yeah? And now I used a bad word, I said mapped. Yeah? So is it a mapping or not? That's an interesting question. It needs to be discussed. Yeah? Um, at least we see that some mapping is involved in this model. Uh, but we are, uh, we are uh, not so much mapping, we are configuring our physical system by the data. And once it is being configured, and this configuration, of course, involves some mapping, but then mapping stops. Then the object is just what it is and we interact with it. And normally if we can tap around uh, as we like, so it's very open in interaction. Um, there's one thing that may be surprising for you. I play this example again. Anything that surprises you here? Ready, steady, go. Yeah? I mean, it's very surprising that uh, quite a long time after I clicked, there was not a single data point. Because if we see this data here, very close to the excitation center here, there's very close around their data points. Why didn't we hear them? The shockwave should have reached them very early on, but it didn't. Yeah? So this is something where the sonification is already giving you some benefit as compared to visualization, because the visualization suggests that these points around the red uh, point C2 are really close by, but they are not, because we see a projection of a 10-dimensional data space. And in the projection, they are close, but in the 10-dimensional space, they are far away. In high dimensional spaces, all data seem to be very far away. Our intuition is not trained to think in high dimensions. So the listening of the shock waves started from any point can recalibrate your idea about how the actually spatial distribution in the 10 dimensional space is. So the, you already uh, here can see something or uh, uh, remove some ignorance uh, by uh, attending carefully of what you hear. Mm. Okay, just uh, that as an example. Uh, and then you can have different types of interactions. Like, it, let's say you would like to have uh, the interaction not to reach so far in a shockwave, but you would instead have uh, some physical interface with which you can scan around. Uh, you see it in this video here, we call it tangible data scanning, and basically it's a sort of uh, data sonogram. Um, the points are now in 3D space. And you see here Eckhart with uh, some tool, which is tracked. And there don't seem to be any data. But here, here's a cluster. <laughs> and, and as you intersect. I was trying to understand the the, the, the red squares uh, represent the do the red red squares represent uh, the masses, or the, there's a there's a static uh, mass screen network that creates the waves or yeah, that, okay uh, every data point is becoming a mass okay and yeah, the I red uh, they are not connected in this model they are in this model they are just attached with a sort of a spring to their default location. So they can just 
oscillate around that. Oh, so yeah. no interaction between the different data points. And the red squares are just the points from which we uh, excited the shock wave. Okay, so each the, the point represents one method that has one string and they're not connected to each other with yeah. the string. Okay. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's another model where, where this is being done called growing neural gas sonification model. Also a nice model, but, but a different one. Yeah, yeah, so, okay. yeah? So and yeah, yeah. the red points are from where the uh, uh, excitation came from. Here in this tangible data scanning, the excitation was from intersecting the data points with this, um, with this uh, triangular inter uh, interface object yeah? that was tracked. And then uh, there was no shock wave uh, emanating and uh, reaching far, but you would only hear the data points that you interact with. And um, it is very interesting, yeah? Yeah, with this da da tangible data scanning and the embodiment with the data, who is the listener here? Is it the audience, the, the person who is embracing this data? Yeah. All of how is this experience different from the digital experience? Uh, the, the listener is the one that is having this device in his hand. Because Eckhart in this case. He, but he wants that to... there is an audience also? Huh? No, no, there's no audience. It's just, just for exploration. It, it wouldn't even make make no much sense for anybody else because, but it's very strong metaphor uh, effect for the one who is in the loop, because even months after we conducted that uh, experiment, we have been referring to this cluster with what, which was lying in the lower area in, in one corner of the room. It, it was embodied so strongly that it, we felt it present. Uh, even long after we, we had this installation in our lab. So having this uh, spatial idea of data is a very strong uh, cue to understand patterns. And then you see, okay, there's a cluster of data here, and then there's an empty space here, and there seems to be one cluster here. And you have a memory of these things as you would have a memory of uh, knowing what is in your um, bookshelf in the uh, upper left corner you Im immediately have an image, yeah? And, and so you gain this type of images in data. Yeah, so this is just, you see that there's infinitely many variations of these uh, uh, models, uh, and this would be conceptually quite similar to this data sonogram model. But the point is, um, the cause of the sound is an interaction which is done by the user, and it's not something that is coming from the data itself. The data itself becomes the sounding object in a state of equilibrium. And then it becomes subject to be excited by anybody else. Uh, I think for a matter of time, perhaps we jump over the next model, although this is also quite nice. Or should we do it? How much time do we have? What time uh, is it? Yes, we have we have twenty five minutes. Well, when oh. is the question period? Yeah, since we are delayed, so the question period is six minutes from now. Six oh. minutes from yes. now, so yes. it's five minutes for questions. Oh, didn't you no, talk no, no, about? No, no, we 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 decided to have question after uh, thirty minutes of the presentation. Yeah. So it's now we have still uh, six minutes more. And okay, we have let, let's minutes. not lose time. I, yeah. I will give, just give you the benefits of model. So, um, um, models are, uh, these model-based sonification are generally applicable. You've seen it with the data sonogram model. At no point did we discern whether this has been data from breast cancer or from plants or from sensors data or whatever. You can do it with all data. Yeah, it doesn't. It, it's, it uh, doesn't matter whether it's ten-dimensional, five-dimensional, one hundred dimensional etc. They are very generally applicable, and um, the knowing the model facilitates the interpretation because if you know there is some shock wave expanding, you know automatically what comes later must be more far distant from where I excited the data set. So, understanding the physicality of the model is a key to understanding the sound. And this is already giving, pushing you into this realm of causal listening. So you, you, you have an understanding what, what's going on in the world rather than what you hear as, uh, as uh, the sound object. 
you see that uh, uh, interaction is built in. Yeah, you, you, it's very difficult to have a model-based sonification without any mechanism for users to excite it. And so it's becoming an interactive sonification uh, if you want it or not, which is good because then you have a closed uh, loop, exploratory loop in which you can investigate your data. You get uh, more complex sounds uh, due to, to holistic dependencies. We didn't have it so much in the, um, in the um, data sonogram model, but maybe this is a good opportunity to quickly show you sounds uh, of, of this model where you inject some particles into a data universe. There are sounds like this here. A very little damping and um, this is sound with uh, low damping and so this is something that you wouldn't be easily obtaining with some uh, some mapping because the trajectory that the particle is doing in this data universe depends on all particles and the individual trajectory that is rendered depend is, is very can be very complex and chaotic so you get something out which you haven't put in and it's very surprising to have these sounds and nonetheless you can extract some clustering structure out of these sounds but let's move on um, so this but this is uh, supporting my point that the, there's more complex sounds possible because of the holistic dependencies like if you have uh, this energy function uh, in which uh, your particles move um, can be very uh, detailed according to your available data. Then it is a task-oriented design. Yeah? You design your model with some task in mind rather than with some data in mind. For instance, you would be able to design a model-based sonification method for cluster analysis. And then you would be able to listen and discern clustering in different data sets no matter where the data come from. That would be uh, your, your focus of sensitivity. And then you can use that for all data sets that you can get hold of. And you have fewer parameters than in, model, in parameter mapping sonification. Yeah? Like in the data sonogram model, what we have, the speed at which the shock wave expands, we've got the springness of the, the stiffness of the springs, we've got the mass of the data points, and very few parameters. But these parameters have the charm and advantage that they are very intuitive because you know if you, um, if you um, upscale the velocity with which the shock wave expands, then the whole process is going to be finished earlier. Yeah? It's going to be at a higher speed. And so the, the physicality of these parameters help you to, un to understand them quite easily. And it connects to everyday listening because we are attending to physical processes as we are used to do our listening in the real world. And that might have a good properties for, for learning these uh, uh, inherent uh, physical bindings. So, uh, this is uh, model-based sonification in a nutshell. Any questions before I move on to wave-space sonification? Um, I, ah, I yeah, Ashen. So, um, as far as I understand, this uh, TDS intangible one is uh, using almost the same procedure with scan synthesis, kind of like uh, it's it's the different from the previous one. It's uh, using uh, multi-dimensional spring mass because like did I have or did I understand completely wrong? Uh, and and this. Uh, so no, that's the difference. Scan can synthesis. You, can you repeat your question? Okay, so let, let me start from the from my first question. Does it use the same principles in scan synthesis? Scan synthesis is uh, something quite different. Yeah, I know, I know. Like the, I'm asking from the, the, the first excitation and uh, the, the spring mass network part, not not the dynamic wave tables and that part, but the, the Using a spring mass transfer to, you know, to using the input to excite the spring mass transfer. That's what I'm asking. Yeah, this is uh, rather uh, 
uh, you, if you uh, would like to know what synthesis technique is, it is, I would say that would be physical modeling. Yeah. Okay. So no, my point was uh, is, is something else actually. But what I was going to ask, since you said that each point, data point represents one mass, so my, yeah. I wonder if when there is a, there are lots of uh, data points, which would mean lots of masses and strings, right? Yeah. Then uh, doesn't it become computationally very expensive? especially to use it in real time. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is not so bad for data sonogram models because these masses are not coupled. But if you have models where um, the oscillation of each mass depends on all the other masses, mm -hmm. then the uh, computational load is in the order of n squared, and then it doesn't scale very well. And that is exactly the reason why uh, 20 years ago when I uh, introduced these models, um, there was just not enough compute power to mm. do it properly. And that's the reason why now we are coming back to it because with modern graphics hardware and GPU computing, we have the power to actually do more complex models in real time. And so it, 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 maybe 20 years ago it was too early to introduce these techniques and only now we can harvest the benefits of it and tap slowly because we can make more complex uh, models in real time and you need this real time uh, capability because you would like the users to interact with it mm -hmm. so it, it is not a really good type of interaction if you if you excite a system and then you have to wait five minutes before the sound has been rendered yeah so uh, but yeah uh, models have the disadvantage of being computationally very very expensive because it boils down to rendering um, the dynamics of a uh, system um, uh, numerically. And if you've got, let's say, 1,000 data points, and uh, then it's about a million operations for each sample, and you need to compute uh, 40,000 samples per second, so you see you run into trouble. That's one of the big problems with, with, with MBS. Um. Yeah, a Shane? Or? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you talk about uh, several models. So, uh, how do we decide that a data set will, uh, I mean, which model to use with a certain data set? Like, are there any requirements that should be satisfied for the data set to be used with a certain model? Or hmm. is it like a trial and error? Yeah, uh, if you think of uh, these sonification models like uh, tools in your toolbox, yeah, you you have a hammer, a gripper, a screwdriver, etc. Et in your toolbox, and normally you choose your tool according to the task that you you have. Yeah, you choose a hammer if you have a nail that needs to go into the wall. Yeah, and not the gripper. <laughs> <laughs> and and likewise, uh, you you have a new data set. And uh, you would like to have some tools to quickly see what structure is going on. Maybe your first idea is to see whether there's some clustering structure going on. Then you would take your clustering um, sonification model and subject the data to that and say, okay, it doesn't seem to be much clustering in it. And then you proceed and test for something else. But uh, it, it's your personal choice which model to use, just like you decide uh, what uh, tools to use to repair an object in, in what order. Mm -hmm. They are not meant to be uh, the ultimate or the only or the right tool for the data set. I rather think of uh, uh, exploratory data analysis as a sequence, exploratory sequence, where step by step you advance your internal model of what's going on in the data by uh, creating auditory perspectives. And so it doesn't matter so much with what you start uh, as long as it helps you to accelerate the, the insight making uh, 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 over the whole session. Helpful? Yeah. Good. Oh, does it mean I should start with a yeah, wave we space? Yeah, 10 minutes more. Okay. Uh, then I Perhaps I should be giving you the, the wave space sonification now for the last 10 minutes. Uh, 
Can I? Yeah. Uh, uh, because I, I think there was some mix-up with the time now. Yeah. How about if we start after lunch with this and we have more than 10 minutes for it? This is, uh, I mean, we have the lecture. Yes, we but I think there was a misunderstanding here. Yeah, we started at no, 11.55, no, so the second... He, was supposed, he asked for 15 minutes for this part. So we will do right? that and then we finish the lecture. I mean, we okay. should kind of stick with the schedule. We are adapting as much as we can, but we have this lecture and then we have the hands-on. That's part of the, okay. the course, how we designed it. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, I'm struggling myself whether less is more and give more time to it would be better. Otherwise, I would really like to show you the wave space sonification so that you have uh, um, a look into all the different techniques uh, around. Yeah. Uh, so should, should I move on to wave space sonification? Yes. Yeah. Good. Okay. So that's quite something uh, recent, uh, just developed last year and presented last June at ICAT. So wave space sonification. Uh, here again, the existing sonification techniques uh, for uh, applicable for time series sonification. We only can use audification. Yeah. Auditory icon circuits not really useful for these type of signals, only in very isolated situations. And parameter mapping sonification is uh, well the number one, uh, the number two technique for time series, I would say. And for model-based sonification, basically um, they are not so useful for time series data because uh, for the setup of a model you abstract from time. So most models that I've been creating were tested with data that were not time indexed. It's quite difficult to to put time index data into sonification models. But so for time series data, um, uh, the prevailing sonification techniques are audification and here the idea is the data becomes a sound signal. The variations of the data as a time series are one-to-one -one becoming the ups and downs of a sound signal. Yeah. And then the parameter mapping sonification, we already said that, that here the data uh, is becoming a little bit like the score. So the instructions to play an instrument. Now what, what key to hit or what string to plug or what hole to fill and how much air to put into your flute or saxophone or whatever. So we, here we've got the idea of a synthesis and the synthesis can be regarded as the instrument and then the data takes the role of controlling the synthesizer, of playing, of becoming the score. Yeah? And in model-based sonification, we already said, here the data is not the score and it's not the sound signal, but it is a way to craft the music, music instrument itself. Yeah? Then the playing is left to the person that excites the model and, and explores it by that. Yeah? So we see that there are quite different paradigms in which data takes a role into the sonification process. And uh, then the question is, well, um, is there another conceptually different link possible between data and signal space? Huh? Other than becoming a sound signal, then controlling a synthesizer, and then becoming an instrument. And um, the answer is, I would say, yes. And that is what I call wave space sonification. Here, the data takes the role of navigating a high dimensional sound space. And that's different from all the other three above paradigms. And I would like to show you what I mean by navigating a high dimensional sound space and how actually these signals, uh, these sonifications then sound. Then we can discuss why they are actually not a model and not parameter mapping. So, here, um, this is a model for uh, this is approach for multivariate data sequences. Time index data are everywhere: EMG, motion cap data, uh, EEG, what you name it. Yeah, this is how they typically look like here. Many data traces which uh, vary over time, and one way to depict them is in in a, a trajectory plot where you have the different uh, features on different axes, and then they take trajectories like that. And if you only have a single variable, let's say ECG or so, like here, this would be an ECG signal. Yeah, Maybe this looks familiar to you. Then you can also create some interesting views by doing a delay embedding. That is plotting the signal against a delayed version on the other axis. 
and then you get these orbits here. These are two delay embeddings with different delays of this data shown here, ECG data. And then you can see orbits and uh, attractors and uh, ask questions such as what is the state space, etc. So this is just basics on, on multivariate time series, series and, and how to understand them. And wave space sonification now makes use of these state space views and anchors the sonification to it by a means of the data navigate this state space. So here is what it means. We've got the data, yeah? multivariate time series, and this is how it would look like. Yeah? We've got some measurements that are organized in time. And now the next step is to create from this data series an embedding. So a view where we can look at this process as a trajectory through a embedding space. Yeah? For instance, this could be a delay embedding. Yeah? And then this is a geometric object, a path yeah? uh, in a space. And now the next step is to uh, identify this trajectory into a signal space, into a wave space. And uh, those of you who are familiar with scanned synthesis may already uh, have an idea that this has uh, something to do with it. But let's see how the story continues. Now what we can do is a morphing that is telling us actually how do we move along this trajectory specifically um, in order to scan what's going on into this high-dimensional sound space. Yeah? A one-dimensional sound space would be like a vinyl uh, turntable disc. Mm -hmm. yeah? That the signal that is one-dimensional, okay, it's in a spiral in a vinyl disc, but you have sound over one spatial dimension. A two-dimensional uh, sound space would be any surface where you have some pattern, uh, vibrational pattern, and depending on in what direction you move with your gramophone needle, you get a different sound. But now this is uh, generalizing this idea towards an arbitrary number of dimensions. You could have an, a wave space, a uh, space where a sound signal lives at every location, organized in 12 dimensions. You, infinitely many directions along which you can go, and when, wherever you go in this direction, you will sample or pick up a certain sound. And so this um, is a wave space in which we have our geometric object unfolded and a morphing tells us how to scan it to get a sound signal. And this sound signal is subjected to a user. And the user, in turn, is enabled to control a number of parameters uh, and, uh, uh, to, to affect the embedding, um, the uh, wave space function itself, and the morphing. So that's, in a nutshell, wave space sonification. And now uh, let's look on the embedding. Um, this is how an ECG signal could be differently embedded. So we see as we change our delay with embedding, we see that we get a different structure popping up. And at some delays, we see that it looks like uh, having a spike here and a spike here. And then here, this structure seems to be more circular. And so it is, this is what would be one interaction that we could do in uh, selecting what type of embedding we would like to have by controlling the delay. Um, then for the morphing, uh, there are different opportunities how we uh, go along this geometric object. Well, if we let the data speed uh, talk, then that would be equally many data points between data points. So sampling points between data points. So the red points are our data points in the geometric object. And the green points are our samples, uh, the locations at which we actually uh, look in the wave space what the value is in order to cr uh, create the sound signal. And there are different opportunities. If we let the data speak, we would be going fast if the data are fast. Uh, and um, we would go at equal speed if... Um, um, uh, independent on how far the data point are apart, and there are more more possibilities to that. So morphing can be said to be a warping of time as such. So we uh, can decouple our sonification even from time. And then to the wave space, um, 
there are many opportunities how you can define a wave space. The most simple one would be an uh, axis aligned signal so that in each direction of your wave space you would have, let's say, a sine signal of different frequency. And then if you move that way, you would hear something different from if you move that way in the wave space. And uh, you can craft your mathematical functions very differently also. So that's wave space sonification in a nutshell. Uh, mathematically, it's just uh, uh, a wave space on an embedding uh, scanned with a certain time uh, morphed time control. But gray is all theory. Maybe let's listen to some uh, wave space sonification in practice. And here this is a, a implementation where we can see, let's maybe get started with, um, with ECG signals. So okay. here you see the plot of the data. Yeah? 25 heartbeats or so, and here you see the delay embedding. And now if I hit start, then we should be seeing the cycle move on. And you hear the heartbeat. And so basically if you only take um, the location in wave space as a value, so have a linear function, then we see that audification is a special case of wave space sonification. Nice, isn't it? So we've got uh, something, a generalized audification. But now the fun part comes. So if we say we don't fit it with uh, some audification, but we take a, a static canonical sinusoidal filling, then we can uh, change the scaling here. Okay, at this point, I would like to make it a little bit more quiet. Is the sound okay in Oslo? Can you hear that? And me speaking as well? Yeah. Good. So then I can increase the scaling here. And then I get this sort of effect. And that happens because as we have these peaks, as we have these peaks, um, the uh, the velocity that we move along in wave space is so high that we pick up lots of these sinusoidal oscillations and they become more salient. We can make it even more extreme. At the same time, we can control the rate and listen to the ECG signals at a higher time resolution. Okay, so that's um, uh, just an example. Let's listening to um, uh, some other things that you can do with this. Um, for instance, we can now fill our um, uh, wave space with some uh, vowel sounds. Yeah, let's take ECG signals again, and what we fill in is now an. A, E, I, O, U, a sample, an audio file. Yeah? So that there's, a, along this axis here, there's a stripe of A, a stripe of E, a stripe of E, a stripe of O, etc. So how does it sound then? And you see the red points here? This is where we are currently. Okay. And you possibly recognize that now the dynamics of the heartbeat has been turned into a rhythmical sequence. Where you have a very you very quickly have the idea what is a typical heartbeat. And as you have uh, some rhythm, rhythm anomalies or so, you will hear that as a, a change in the rhythmical organization of the heartbeat. And uh, so you can craft your sounds uh, as you need. Here, just another example. You do not have to time look on the epilepsy and other examples. But here we've got uh, uh, something like I can show you here on the slide. Um, here we've got. Uh, uh, and the sound R here and the sound S here. And along this diagonal, I've put a sound signal which is 
Yeah? So as we move along, we get an, uh, here an, an R S R S. Yeah. Now let's listen how this sounds if uh, if you have the model rendering. Oh, S, oh, S, oh, yeah? S, makes sense. Oh, yeah? S, oh, S, oh, S, oh, S, oh, S, oh, S. And you can have it at different oh, speeds. S, oh, S, and so on. So it's very playful. There's so many parameters I can't show you how they all work. But basically, you've got the idea you scan this wave space. And you can configure your wave space as required for your analysis job. So uh, running out of time, let's do quickly a, a summary. Uh, within the analog symbolic spectrum, um, the, uh, we have to extend it to include wave space sonification. And actually, the beauty of it is that it spans the whole scope from very analogic you know, audification is a special case of wave space sonification. Too very symbolic, because if you put in very, we can even put ear can sounds as sound material at certain locations in the wave space. And then we have something very symbolic. Mm -hmm. And because we have got this continuity in the process, we not only have the ear cans, but we, the ear cans are moved along at a certain velocity profile. So it's all the time analogic uh, as well. So it's really covering the whole spectrum from very analogic to very symbolic. And this is giving designers very good perspectives in crafting this according to the uh, ends, the different ends, analysis ends. So wave space sonification embeds a time series data into a vector space to navigate a wave space with a given time morphing. That's in a nutshell the idea of wave space sonification. It provides rich, well-controllable auditory gestalts corresponding to the dynamics and supports exploratory, analog, and communicative symbolic uses. And uh, it is not a parameter mapping, yeah? because we are definitely having here some very highly analogic process like an audification being involved. It is not an audification. Audification is only a special case of wave-based sonification. And it's definitely not a model because uh, we do not have the notion of any dynamic system being in operation without interaction of the user. It is tailored for time series data. At the moment, it is um, semi real time capable. I'm currently working on a version that can render in real time for mocap situations and for physiotherapy applications. Uh, and I see in this area lots of potential for this wave space sonification to make new impulses to the design because for the designers they can think of it in terms of putting audio material and organizing in a wave space. Uh, sound synthesis wise it has some similarity to scan synthesis but where a synthesis, scan synthesis is more interested in the um, in the in crafting uh, sounds here this is a technique for learning something about the underlying data so and uh, maybe the last slide before i finish off um, sonification is a really highly interdisciplinary research field and we've seen that we have uh, a lot to bring lots of things together from task analysis data signal rendering sound synthesis audio projection sound signals what are the sensations caused by the sound? What are the perceived patterns? How to evaluate an auditory display? How to put it into a practical application working together with application of, uh, field uh, users? And what the theory behind it and how does it affect uh, our social structures, even auditory pollution, etc. cetera. Um, and, and so it is really a stretch to uh, combine all these skills into a single person and my experience is that the best uh, work come from teams where you have got one domain expert, where you've got sonification expert, and where you've got some, uh, somebody who's really skilled and uh, um, uh, trained in designing sounds, media artists, etc. At least these three you would have, maybe even a fourth or fifth uh, person being involved. 
in order to uh, really uh, close the circle and have uh, some system to go. And uh, so uh, if you do sonification, uh, have your mind and your arms very open to embrace whatever input comes from the outside because this is just going to help uh, solving this huge problem. To learn, I recommend the Sonification Handbook, freely available, and I think you all know it. And with this, I uh, stop talking. I thank you for your attention, and I don't know whether we've got some time for questions. Yeah. Let's see. Yes. Of so thank you. you can. Yes. Especially the, the, the this last part uh, about the late space uh, sonification. So, uh, well, I would have questions that would uh, take hours, <laughs> but uh, mainly what I'm wondering is so, depending on the nonlinear function uh, you use, uh, then you can also create dynamic timbers that evolve over time, right? If you want. If we wish, as a, as a, from a designer perspective, I'm asking it. Yes. Okay. That was. <laughs> yeah. I, well, if, uh, then I can. Uh, I, I also have many detailed questions, but I will just say. Yeah. For, for the dynamic temper, the, the yeah. big problem is that you never know in advance how fast the sound is going to traverse through any location in wave space. And so the perceived temper. Uh, is going to be uh, uh, broken if you go through wave space 10 times as fast, yeah? then you could have aliasing and all these issues. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. That's an issue. So yeah. for, for that sake, I jumped a little bit over it, but in my slides, uh, and if you read the paper on wave space sonification, there's also the idea of what's called granular wave space sonification. So here again, we stick to the idea of going through wave space along this geometric object that our data dictates. But at each location, we, we, we basically, we, we let a grain move along with its own velocity profile. And this allows us to let the data dictate how fast we progress in space, but have these grains uh, scanning the wave space at an independent velocity. And this is a, a good idea for designers because then you can uh, just choose your sounds according to your preferences and control at which time you go through these sounds by means of the speed model for the grains. So uh, it is wave space sonification is just being tapped into and just introduced. And I think it has uh, some open ends and lots of open things that needs to be worked on in order to make it really practical for, for uh, uh, applications. Yeah. Great, thank you. Any more questions? And do we have time? We, I can no. ask you in the break, or? Uh, let's have questions. Yeah, we can try now. Uh, could you, uh, we, you briefly went into examples of uh, several dimensional uh, aspects of sonification, but what is the advantage and disadvantage of sonification in many dimensions? And uh, can the sonification be perceived, heard, uh, as more than four dimensions? So is there a limitation between what we hear and the representation in uh, more than four dimensions. Why did we say four dimensions? What is p particular about four dimensions? For uh, placement in uh, in space and over time. Ah, okay, that like yeah. perceived. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. But the data set is. Uh, yeah. You, you can have many relation? more dimensions. Like in, in data uh, sonification models, you you easily can have twenty or thirty dimensions. Yes, but can you hear them? Can you like? You, you never hear the dimensions, but you hear the structure. Mm. So what, what could be types, I would rush a little bit over it, but what would be from a data miner's perspective interesting structures? One structure would be clustering. Yes. And if you've got, let's say, um, um, uh, clusters, they have different distances, they have different locations, they mm -hmm. have different sizes, they have different amounts of data points in it. 
And these clusters live in this high dimensional space. So the moment you project onto low dimensional spaces, you have the risk that the clusters cannot be separated anymore. Um, and, and so it makes sense to have this cluster analysis being done in the high dimensional space. Mm. However, it's even difficult to um, visualize the many spaces. But in, in terms of structure, it would be just uh, relevant that you could discern different sounds for the different clusters. And, yeah. uh, and, and the sound, of course, doesn't live in the high dimensional space. It lives in our auditory space. And whether this is one dimensional or high dimensional, that's a matter of how, how you look at it. But uh, f uh, discerning is, a, uh, is possible of many clusters. Yeah. But yeah, you never hear the dimensions. But, uh, but you get rid of the problem of reducing dimensions. Very often, yes. if you do some plotting, you are forced to reduce dimensions because your screen is only two-dimensional. And in sound, the parameter mapping is reducing dimensions also because your sound is only one-dimensional and you organize your material in time. Mm. But why uh, can't we have a method where we are not forced to reduce dimensions? And model-based sonification is giving you an opportunity for that. Is this? Uh, uh, yeah, I think maybe I need to think about this more because it's, it's very complex. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, it's just something that needs to be learned. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, we're running out of time, so maybe we can continue this uh, uh, after the break or after we are over, after Paul or something. So uh, thank you so much, uh, and I uh, apologize for like uh, we are quite delayed. However, we can uh, adjust it so wait. Um, and uh, so yeah, we are very grateful for like uh, uh, Thomas. Uh, it was really inspiring and. We had so many possibilities and you were like open so many doors. Uh, probably it's like very interesting and we would uh, yeah, follow up early. Um, right, so thank you so much. Okay, thank you.